Hi, so uh, let's say you're on a walk in the woods, maybe in Colorado or Wyoming. You're uh, on what seems like a well-worn path, but it's actually quite overgrown. And I'm here to tell you, beware. Land that looks solid may actually be honeycombed. The miners may have left, but their works may remain. You may find yourself plunging unexpectedly into the legacy of history. So recently, some recent plunges into the legacy of history in state and federal policy, for example, the McCleary decision in Washington state, or the checkered history of No Child Left Behind, led me to undertake a mammoth excavation project to unearth all the state, federal, and territorial educational provisions in constitutional and organic law from 1785 through the early 20th century. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about some interesting things in different state and territorial histories, but I've also come to focus on two historic pivot points in federal education policy. One was during the 1870s and 80s, when, I like to say, we came the closest we have ever come, then or since, to having a truly national educational system in the United States. The other pivot point is in 1948, when a broad coalition of educators, policymakers, and legislators got together to really deliberately try to learn the lessons of that earlier effort to establish a national education system in order to develop a new legislative set of policies that essentially became the National Defense Education Act of uh, 1958 and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, known more recently as No Child Left Behind. So as a historian, one thing I'm doing is connecting the dots between these different events and periods in history. But I'm also trying to assess the long-term and ongoing consequences of some of the choices that were and were not made during that earlier time period. The 1870s and 80s, in some ways, were a period of incredible possibility and contingency in educational policy. It was that period in the first couple decades after the Civil War when actually the federal government had some new powers. But even more importantly, it was a period in which the questions of, for example, how are we going to educate newly emancipated freed people? How are we going to interact with the existing educational policies in sovereign nations in Indian territory? or with Mexican Americans in the territories of the West. Those questions were still open, and they were still being openly debated. But as we know, we didn't establish a national education system in the 1870s and 80s that was aimed at strengthening and equalizing education. Instead, we essentially did something like the opposite. Congress basically gave a green light to states to develop often deliberately unequal educational systems and policies. So we went from what I think of as a world of contingency when many paths were open to a world of path dependence where a certain trajectory of institutional development that was difficult to reverse continues to shape the basic logic of federal education policy to this day. It's a very complex story, but one thing I've learned that I'd like to share with you now, and that's how the very limits of federalism, of federal capacity to develop viable national policies that cross multiple jurisdictions, those very limits are what send us over and over down the path of trying to rely on social science data to redefine as deficiencies of the people what are really deficiencies of the states. And that's how we get from the realities behind the McCleary decision to an achievement gap. 
That's how we continue to plunge into the legacy of history.